Welcome to the Robohub Podcast. I'm here with Nico and Emil, two of the co-founders of Rerun. Can you guys uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Sure, uh, I can start. So yeah, I'm Nico. I'm uh, yeah one of the co-founders and the, the CEO of, uh, of Rerun. I'm super quick. I guess my background is as a computer vision and machine learning engineer. And I've been prior to Rerun building um, just computer vision ML powered uh, products that usually somehow run out in the physical world. So Emil and I, we got to know each other at a Swedish startup doing 3D scanning of feet to recommend shoes. And so we did that for together for a bunch of years. And then after that, I've been doing a lot of different mobile, mobile kind of things. Um, yeah, maybe that's I'll, I'll stop there for now. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm Emil. Um, I'm uh, yeah, I'm from Sweden. I'm a programmer. That's really who I am. I'm an engineer. I've been working in a lot of different industries from physics simulation to game engines, game programming, and uh, 3D scanning and uh, computer vision. And I uh, fell in love with Rust five years ago. So <laughs> I'm one of those annoying people who thinks we should rewrite everything in Rust. Yeah, so what what uh, motivated you guys to start Rerun? I guess the, the story starts at, at that company we worked at uh, together. Um, so that company was called Volumental and I said the 3D scanning and like physical retail, a bunch of computer vision. And um, yeah, that's actually a really, really tough product to build. Uh, physical retail is, is tough. It's you know, everything that you could imagine goes wrong, goes wrong. And one of the, the reasons that 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 company ended up being successful, that product at least ended up being as successful is that we built really good internal visualization tools. So that meant it was really easy as a developer to just at any point in your algorithms or kind of the, anywhere on the system, input data, output data, like just an internal state is really easy to just understand, uh, visualize that data like over time and, and so on, um, synced with your text logs. And it's just like a really good system. Long story short, I guess that was uh, really powerful. That company it was an internal tool for the developers, but it ended up being using it for like data labeling and kind of operations and kind of yeah, support. And then I left Volumenta after a couple of years and, and kind of I just couldn't <laughs> live without it, I guess. I've been sort of wandering in the desert since. Um, and I've been building like bad versions of that tool um, many times. Um, and basically, I, I I ran another company before this, and and the kind of lack of good tooling was like incredibly painful there. Uh, so, so that that company didn't end up uh, working out, and and kind of as that was happening, I guess so I was doing a lot of a lot of soul searching, and Emil and I got back to talking and talking with uh, with Moritz and kind of talking about this problem a lot. The idea is is way too hard to build these kind of computer vision or like perception um, heavy products. And largely because of the the lack of good tools, um, and some of those those tools that need to exist that are not really there in a good way right now, we felt this is around visualization and kind of the all the data infrastructure aspects related to that. Um, yeah, so we just want to kind of have that not be the case anymore. No company should shut down and fail because of of that. And like a lot more interesting, useful uh, things could get built for the real world, and people shouldn't have to deal with all this stuff. Yeah. So, and, and when you talk about like all of the internal tooling that you have to build um, in order to visualize, you know, so obviously part of that is being able to just understand the data, understand what you're looking at. You know, it's really hard to look at um, text output and understand what that means to the real world, right? Yeah. Um, so there's there's the obvious use case for the developer because it just helps them debug. It helps them like figure things out. What are some of the other use cases that are maybe like less internal, but a little bit more uh, yeah, external facing. Um, well, I think it, you know, with these kinds of products, it kind of touches most people at the end of the day. So, I mean, you, a lot of products, like even a self-driving car or something, you need to show some visualizations of basically what, what uh, kind of the perception and planning algorithms are doing, right? At Volumental, we had these Friday demos every Friday where we just demonstrate something we built every week. And uh, the more visual and beautiful you can make that, uh, the more points you got, <laughs> so to say. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's really like it made you want to think, like, how can I best present this to my colleagues? And it just improved the understanding of the product throughout the organization. Yeah, and It basically gave everyone a view into the product, into how the machine was working and thinking. 
Um, so, so it's kind of those, one of those things that you don't anticipate all the value you'll get for, from it until mm-hmm. you actually have it. And then, of course, there's more obvious things like ops things like, oh, we, we have a scanner that's not working properly. Well, look at, look at visualization data, see what's happening. Oh, there seems to be some sort of glare disturbing around the cameras. Very easy to detect once you have good visualization and anyone in the company can do it. You don't have to find a tech to do so. so it's, it's just very useful all around. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a it's an incredibly good point where like, you know, creating these tools, let people go fish for themselves. Right. Like if yep. you don't understand what the you know, what the problem is with the the output that you're getting here, you're not talking to an engineer. You can go figure that answer out for yourself and then iterate quickly. People aren't being uh, bottlenecked on engineering resources to answer these questions. Yeah, definitely. I yeah. mean, for, for one example, you can often we could see it in like the quality of um like issues coming in from from like operations or support, uh, like if they're able to themselves kind of dig into it a bit, like you can sometimes see maybe something's wrong with camera calibration or something. And if you look at the point cloud, you'll just see it like completely bent. And like everybody can see that a flat surface is not bent. It, okay, it takes a bit more to understand like what the causes might be, but just the support ticket that comes out of that is very different from. Um, like the scanner thinks that uh, my customer is an Apple. Like that is, uh, you know, that's not as helpful. Or confidence below 0. 0.95. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, and is the, is the product open source now? How do people sign up for this? Yeah, they, yeah, it's, go ahead. Sorry, you, <laughs> they sign up by, you know, pip installing it or, or uh, just uh, getting the source code or, um, Cargo ad if you're a Rust Rust user, but yeah, it's fully open source at uh, GitHub.com/rerun-io/rerun, uh, or just rerun.io and <laughs> click the links. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're, that's our strategy. We're an open core company. Yeah, yeah, and just very recently, also the beta got released, right? So this is the first time you're having customers interact with this at a at a um, somewhat larger scale. Yeah, yeah, we released um, mid February. Uh, mm-hmm. Released for us meant uh, you know putting together a little little demo video, I guess, to sort of show the idea, but mainly just open sourcing the repository and making sure it's easy to install. And um, yeah, it's been really fun to see what what people have been building with it so far, and kind of what the community is is excited about, and like it's not you know really missing, of course, as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, what's the reception been? What's been some of the things that they've uh, been excited about and less excited about? Well, I, I think um, one of the things that that people love is that it's it's very fast. I guess the Rust Rust comes in there, and I mean we built kind of the whole stack from the ground up, and Rust very inspired by the kind of how how you'd build a modern kind of game engine, and and uh, well, there there are many things, but I guess that that is one thing that tends to come up. Yeah, this is one of our main focus is to reduce the number of paper cuts and make it as easy as possible for people to get started. So it's basically pip install, rerun SDK, and then rerun.log image to log an image. And mm-hmm. uh, that's it. That's, that's basically it. And you'll see that image. And if you log multiple images, you can get a time slider to slide back and forward in time to see what happened before. If you log mm-hmm. a point cloud, you'll see that point cloud projected in your 3D space and, and so on and so forth. It's just as easy as we could make it. Uh, and so also, you know, as you're building a, a product that's completely open source, you know, how are you guys towing the line between that and, um, you know, creating a business that can sustain itself and continue to provide more updates in the future going forward? Yeah, so the way we're thinking about it basically is that everything that a single developer or researcher might need for, you know, their own work like working on locally on their machine or maybe like you know with a robot or a device and their their laptop or or something that all of that basically goes square into the completely free and open source uh, bucket mm-hmm. and then there are there are a bunch of things um that are helpful for for teams uh so one of those things is just like sharing and collaboration um to do that well you need some more infrastructure to do that really well some extra functionality but also yeah, just running infrastructure that makes that easy so that that goes in the paid bucket, for instance, and then there are a lot of things also around performance, 
when you get data sets that become come a little bit larger and just handling that and making it fast, particularly fast around collaboration, there's a lot that gets goes into to making that sing or like do really well. I guess so. Mm. So that also goes into paid. So that that's kind of where we draw the paid free split. Yeah. So if a if a developer is trying to run this on their own local machine, that's the part that's open source. They install yeah. it, pip install, they yeah. can run it. And then once you're trying to go and like uh, do this across like a, maybe a larger Teams or something that requires the cloud, um, this is where it's a you know more of an enterprise sale at that point. Yeah, yeah, cool. something like that. Yeah, it, we like should that. note that so far we we haven't built our uh, commercial thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really these are this point. is the plan. Yeah, an important <laughs> point right now. We only have the free uh, version. Yeah. yeah. So what, what, you know, what's the ecosystem around, uh, visualizing computer vision, you know, what are the tools that are out there right now and how are you guys fitting within that ecosystem? I think the comparison are the, are like matplotlib and open 3d or plotly or just these like plotting libraries, um, mm -hmm. and then building something yourself. Uh, I think that is really the major. Uh, major comparison or open CV im show those those kinds of things um, otherwise if you get into all the like for within robotics if you want to be like within your robotics environment uh, then it will be ross kind of style tools so arvis or or foxglove or like um, xvis or you know those those kinds of more like other kinds of uh, bigger platforms and and then term like on the scale of uh, the different visualization tools that Nico painted out there like we, what we aim to be is as easy as and as lightweight as these you know, matplotlib uh, opencv in show or something but still be almost as powerful as these uh bigger products uh and you know, eventually as powerful or more powerful so we're, we're trying to take this approach from like taking the small the simple use case and building a very complex uh, or complex and rich visualization out of that yeah mm. it's a very ambitious project <laughs> yeah yeah this is very ambitious yeah no and it, and it's a very important project too because i think like you know as we spoke about before the the value that this brings to being able to like communicate these things internally and externally across like different departments is super valuable and everybody's building this again and again in each of their own company yeah, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> yeah, so what are you guys uh, excited about developing uh, at Rerun? I think oh, right now, everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, our, our focus right now is, is basically you're yeah, really honing in on the super early stage of, uh, of, of working. So just replacing Imshow. I think Imshow and, and simpler uses of like PyPlot or whatever plot and draw geometries of uh, so just those like core function calls that you'll call in line in your Jupyter notebook. Uh, I think uh, just replacing them and by with something much more built for computer vision and other like perception robotics developers. Um, that's easier to use and more powerful. I think that's, that's what we're super excited about building like right now, right now. It's really interesting. I do like, um, really appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Because this is like one of those, it's one of those things that's super annoying to do, right? Yeah. And um, yeah. so what, one of the experiences that also I've gotten out of uh, my previous startup, Baller TV, um, we built like, we built this, an iPhone app that you can like put at the side of like a volleyball game, basketball game, soccer game. And um, it would detect where the players are, where the ball is, where the court is. It would map that in 3D space from a single camera. And then um, we would like take the distortion parameters and like undistort it. And I mean, one of the things that we learned, it like, it took a lot of time to go from being able to detect these things and like, you know, your machine learning person understands what's happening. Um, and the computer vision team, like they, they know what's happening to a degree and they can somewhat say like how good things are going. But everybody else in the company is kind of like, you know, a little bit blind to like, oh, is yeah. it following the action there? Like, I don't know. You know, it's like, can't really tell. Um, and then some effort was put into like visualizing, you know, creating uh, uh, 3D models of the field 
and the players on it based off of uh that the data that was collected yeah. underneath yeah i think that was actually one of my early thoughts and one of our thing our in my and emil's first conversations around this when we were like thinking about it was like i at the time was reading a lot of um books about like gaming history hmm. and uh, just thinking a lot about i think one of them was actually was uh, reading um uh, I don't remember what it's called now, but the, the canonical one about id software and like Carmack and Masters and of Doom. Yeah, Masters of Doom. And just um, kind of thinking about like how gaming companies tend to organize themselves. Like there's really like this much more clear split of like there's the engine people, there's like mm. the artists, and then there's like this tooling team kind of in between that you're like really thinking of like um, one team that yeah, really builds an engine and then uh, that built kind of comparing that to how I've seen product teams work in, um, in computer vision teams. And it hasn't been like that really at all. Like the algorithm teams aren't building like an algorithm engine for someone else to build an app on top of. Hmm. They're just solving the, sol the thing. They're just solving, here's the solution. And now you can build something around it. But that ends up being that the, the product people don't really understand enough. So the algorithm people have to be the product people also hmm. it ends up being like that if as long as there's some interaction or something that we really really involved in all that um so i think there's something in in that too that really the handoff should be much more hmm. the algorithm team is like handing over also like the understanding of how this works so that you can have intuition and be like make good product decisions around it um hmm. which i think very easy and very good visualization can be or is should be like a, a really important part of Hmm. Yeah. So not only is it making like the engineers more effective because they're not like sinking as much time into trying to create the visualizations themselves, but also it's making the product people more effective because they're like, they have a better understanding of what they're trying to spec the product for. I think that yeah. can be honestly probably a bigger value really longer, longer term. Right? It is, it's really hard to build these like intelligent products. They have a, like some intelligent behavior. And if you don't understand that behavior, it's like really hard to design for then another person to use that product that you're building. That's like a very complex, like value prop to, to get people to understand, yeah. right? Like you don't understand that, like, you know, why is visualization important, right? It's, it's kind of hard to explain that like, oh, it's not just because it saves engineering development time. It's like, this is, this is like business intelligence that you're yeah. building. Like how, how do you get the CEO to understand what this engineer is working on and the product person to understand and everybody's on the same page because without that visualization, it's difficult. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to like, if you think back to Florence Nightingale, who wanted to improve the situation for field hospitals, you're coming war and couldn't get the attention of the politicians until she came up with a visualization showing, uh, she, she came up with a pie chart showing that more people were dying in the hospitals than in, in battle. And that got people's attention, like, oh, shit. Yeah, we really have to do something about these hospitals. Uh, it's, it's once you can put a picture to something, you can really convince people uh, and uh, make them understand what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. How do you market that? <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll see, like, if you go to our website, you'll not find anything about that, right? Um, I think part of it is, you don't necessarily need to upfront market all the all values if the market isn't like ready and understands that yet. So part of our I, it's a two part two part thing. I think for us, it's like yeah, we just focus on the developers. They know they need it. Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's kind of stage one for us. Also, you talked to a lot of like CEO. Like you'd be surprised to talk to CEOs um, at companies that are bigger than you might expect that are thinking about this actually there's like uh their internal tooling and the fact that their different teams aren't don't understand the same thing you can't communicate and that's spending a lot of efforts actually like a priority for them um hmm. so that was i guess early on we did a lot of market like exploration and that was i guess one surprising surprising part yeah. Yeah, I, there's also yeah but it's really hard to market so it's a good very good question uh there's also the the yeah. the um the quality of serendipity that comes from visualizing data. Like once you visualize the data you have, you suddenly have ideas you didn't 
wouldn't have otherwise you like we were doing this foot scanning application at, at Polimental, as i said and once we started visualizing like the point clouds that we had from these depth cameras it became pretty obvious like wait these point clouds are actually dense enough that we should be able to do a much more accurate 3d reconstruction that we're, that we're currently doing uh, things like that happen all the time it's like once we actually could saw the see the raw data you can see opportunities as well as uh, problems that we otherwise wouldn't see and it, yeah it's very hard to to market explain this but i think engineers who live work in visual fields uh, and have done visualizations itself already know this but, um, yeah 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 i mean one of the other values is you know there's a lot of uh if you don't understand how a system works it leads to a lot of speculation right and then yeah. being able to show like yeah, so you can get speculation from people across like I know absolutely nothing about how the thing works, but it's like, oh, it must be because of you know, this yeah. is wrong. It's like yeah. maybe that's not the case at all. But if you can visualize it in a way that's clear, usually the answer becomes like much more apparent. Yeah, it's, for sure. I've had a problem in game that a lot of times people just speak like wildly and you they spend like Twenty minutes visualizing it, and like, yep, this is the problem. It was nothing to what anyone <laughs> speculated. <laughs> Completely different. <laughs> that happened all the time. Yeah, it's honestly one of the more funny things about being like an algorithm developer of some kind. Hearing like people coming telling you why the thing you built is not working, like what they're telling, like <laughs> it doesn't. It, this is what it does. Like it doesn't understand <laughs> when I do this, and and when I, and and then you look at the data under, and it's like not even close. People have. Just, I think any system that has like some complex, complex behavior and can interact with it, people will come up with a mental model, and uh, be, many people are also very confident in their own mental model. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think they're actually, when it comes to like optimizing your code, I think engineering as a culture has internalized that you should always profile before you optimize, and I think we need to internalize the same thing mm -hmm. uh, for for visualization. It's always visualized before you fix a bug or improve an algorithm. Yeah. It's very similar. This profiling is just a way to visualize performance, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, like in uh, university, uh, well, I had always, I guess, been told, like, ah, oh, yeah, when you're done with your math problem, like you should double check it by, you know, hand graphing it uh, and little stuff like that, or in the beginning of the problem, like always draw it. And when the math was, I don't know, when you're younger and math was maybe not complex enough, I just sort of like whatever that's just they're just trying to get me to do more work but i just remember some professor or whatnot like really hammered that in in university and like holy shit that helps a lot <laughs> like okay here's some weird linear algebra problem just draw it and you're actually it's probably pretty easy um that was yeah probably the main thing i brought brought away from from all that math that i have now forgotten mostly <laughs> I mean, we have like, what is it like a third or a quarter of our brain is just visual uh, processing. Like we're visual mm -hmm. thinkers. It's, it's worth to play into our strength as uh, human beings as well. Yeah. yeah. Is that one of the reasons you guys also chose robotics first? Is because it's such a big visual component and super complex? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, I can't speak for, for Emil, but I, I guess I got in it from a more like a practical application that I really want to solve. but. I guess I stayed because it's so fun to do something like really advanced and cool. And then, yeah, you get to see it. I think it's super satisfying. Yeah. I mean, th this is our background uh, since we work with, well, I don't have a robotics background. I have a computer vision background, but I, I think robotics without computer vision is very much a subset of, of uh, robotics All robotics do oh. computer vision. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do believe uh, the tool we're building is applicable to a lot of things outside that as well. Uh, in particular, I'm interested to see what the gaming community could, can use with rerun once we have uh, some C++ um, libraries for them. Because right now our API is only, our SDK is only for Python and Rust. Uh, but once we have some C++ libraries, I think it will be interesting to see how it can be used for the gaming community. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you. This was yeah. really fun. Oh, thanks. Yeah.